All right, good morning, and welcome back to another lecture for pre-calculus. Today we're, we're going to be going over uh, <clears throat> sections from Chapter 6. Um, before we get into those, um, I want to say thank you for taking your test last Thursday and Friday. Uh, if you're one of the people who took it, I will be grading those uh, as I have time in the next couple days. Uh, my goal is to get them done before Wednesday morning, um, but I've got assignments due today, tomorrow, and Wednesday for my own classes, so... Uh, I'm a little bit, I'm a little bit tight on time, um, but I'm I'm trying to work through those as fast as I can so that I can get to your tests. Um, uh, today we've got sections 6.1, 2, and 3 homework due. Uh, this Tuesday and Thursday we'll have office hours like normal. Um, Wednesday class again 8 to 9:20 in the morning, and then on Friday we've got a quiz on those three sections. Um, I wish I could give you a break from homework for a couple days here like last time after the test, but that's just not in the cards this time. Um, next week we've got three more sections, 6.4, six, 6.5, six, and 6.6, six, six, which is what I'm going to cover today uh, in these lectures that I'll be posting. We'll have normal office hours, normal class, and a normal quiz on Friday again. The next week, this is the second week in May now, uh, that's the last week of classes. Uh, the last day is officially Tuesday will be having office hours as normal on that day so if you want to have any final questions before the end of the year uh, that's when you can uh, that's when you can go ahead and ask those questions uh, the previous day on Monday May the 10th we'll be having homework the last homework of the year uh, from section 7 1 and 7 2 due um, and then the final will be during the days the 12th through the 15th so keep an eye out for more details coming up on that uh, like the tests, I will put out either a mock test um, or a set of questions uh, for the final, and then I'll again provide solutions to all those things in the form of uh, in the forms of these videos, which are partitioned out to be small videos about each problem or small groups of problems. So if you have any questions leading into finals week in the next couple weeks, please just let me know. Um, I'm happy to answer your questions via email or in office hours or in class, uh, whichever way is best for you. Uh, and so we'll go ahead and get right into it today. Um, like I said, we're going to be going through sections 6, 4, 5, and 6 today. This first video is on 6.4, which is inverse trig functions and right angles. So this should bring you right back to section 5.5 .5, where we first learned about inverse trig functions. Um, so before we, we looked at how um, trig functions take you from one set, which I'll represent here using a circle, uh, one set where we had points which were like an arc length or an angle, right? And then they took you to some number in this set between negative 1 and 1. If you're working with sine or uh, cosine, if you're working with tangent, uh, they would take you from to some value in this range, positive infinity down to negative infinity, right? Um, so these are the uh, the values, the, the the range, the x, y numbers, right? The cosine tells you the x, the y tells you the sine, um, and then the tangent tells you the ratios of these things. So I will call these now ratios of x, y, and I'll add one more number in, 1, because that's what we were looking at before. Sine would take you to the ratio of y divided by 1, and cosine would take you to the ratio of x divided by 1, and tangent would take you from an angle to the ratio of y divided by x. And then the reciprocal functions, cosecant, secant, and cotangent, well, they take you from an angle to a ratio as well. Cosecant, which is the reciprocal of sine, takes you to the ratio of 1 over y. Secant, the reciprocal of cosine, takes you to the ratio of 1 over x. And cotangent takes you to x over y. So we can think of these trig functions uh, from 5.5 as taking us from an angle to a ratio. And then the inverse takes you backwards, right? It takes some ratio and it sends you back to some angle. And we remember that we had to restrict we had to restrict these things. For example, sine 
inverse in order to make it a real function um, we have to say hey it has the domain of negative one to one and in order to make it a function we have to give it a range that is negative pi over two to pi over two so just to jog your memory I'm gonna write these out cosine inverse as a function remember because the inverse of some x-coordinate gives you an infinite set of angles that give you that same x-coordinate uh, it had a domain of negative 1 to 1 and the range was from 0 to pi we only selected a, a little piece of it so that we had a function a tangent inverse In some ways, it's kind of like the nicest of these, because you can you can take any real number and plug it in to the tangent inverse. You don't have to worry about where it's at, um, and it's no harder in terms of range than any of the others. So it's it's kind of like the nicest one. All right, so these were our inverse functions that we've defined before, and I, I said there were other ways to write these like arc tangent, arc sine, etc. So there we have it. There's a nice little table for us of our inverse functions. Okay, um, but now we're not talking about circles, are we? Now we're talking about triangles. Um, so what do these ratios become uh, in this new perspective, or from this new perspective? Well, they're, they're no longer necessarily x and y coordinates, right? Now these things are angle, sorry, now these, these things are side lengths. Okay. So, um, we'll go ahead and we'll get into something here real quick. Uh, this, this section and the next two sections, um, because we've seen sort of the theory, uh, now these sections are in large part just computation and they, in the book, there's lots of problems which require um, quite a lot of just calculator use. So I'm going to pick one here and I'll do one um, that does not require a calculator. This is going to be 8a. Um, there's, there's no theory, no new theory to present. So this video is going to be just example problems. Um, so I'm picking 8 uh, and 8a and 8b and 8c are all just computations that you can do without a calculator. Um, so that's kind of review because we've already done that. Uh, and then I'm going to do some of the examples from the book that, well, do require a calculator, but problems which I won't use a calculator for. I'll leave them in exact form, the way that you would leave them on, say, a test or on a final. So here we go. 8a. 8a says find the sine inverse. of negative root 3 over 2. So this is really just a practice warm-up question. 8b says find the cosine inverse of negative 1 half. And then c says find the tangent inverse of negative root 3. So just to warm up, I'll take you through all these, and then we'll we'll hit some of the harder application questions from this section, which really won't be very hard. Um, and we can think of these things like um, uh, from the triangle perspective. Um, that's fine. We can also think of these things uh, in the uh, circular perspective. You know what? This zoom thing makes some of this stuff so easy. Uh, there we go. That, that's nice, being able to transfer that and squish it together. All right, uh, so 8a. This is just something that we've got memorized, I hope, at this point. What does sine inverse of negative root 3 over 2 mean? It means we've got some ratio. That ratio is one that we are familiar with. And we are going to try and trace it back to find the angle which gives us that. And the range of sine inverse tells us which angle we're going to select. 
right? Because there's so many angles that give us that one y coordinate. If we remember this unit circle perspective, we take some angle and the sign in sign of it is negative root three over two. So that's it's like down here. So there's an angle here, there's an angle here, right? This angle. There's also this angle. But then there's also this angle. And there's also this angle. All of those have the same y coordinate of negative root 3 over 2. And then we can just go around the circle more times and we have an infinite list. So which one do we pick? Well, we have to pick the one that's between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2, which is an angle from up here down to here. And that makes it a little more obvious which angle we're going to pick. It's not going to be those top two, and it's not going to be this one. It's going to be this one. So which one is it? Well, I hope we have this one memorized. It's going to be negative, okay? because that's where we're going clockwise around the circle. We're going down, and it's going to be negative pi over 3. Okay. All righty. Uh, cosine inverse of negative one half. So it's, it's kind of the same story here with the unit circle. Negative one half cosine of an angle is going to be negative one half, right? So negative one half is about right here. And so there's lots of angles. We can go here. We can go here. We can go backwards. We can go around the circle more times. There's an infinite list of angles. Which one are we going to pick? Well, we look at the cosine inverse's range. We have to pick angles between 0 and pi. And there should only be one. So it's, it's not this negative one. That's too big. It's not this negative one. It's not in 0 to pi. This one's over pi. It's not that one. So it's got to be that one. So what is that angle? Again, this is something that you should have memorized, especially having not taken the test. Think about maybe the reference angle if you're still struggling with it. Okay, What is this reference angle? Right, that's the positive number, which has a cosine of 1 half. So that is going to be just like what we had. That's pi over 3. Right? The y coordinate is this. And remember, that always comes in a pair with 1 half. Right? Root 3 over 2 and 1 half are always a pair of xy coordinates. So if the sine, sorry, if the cosine is one half, then the y is going to be root three over two, which means this is the angle we're dealing with. So this is the reference angle. So what do we have here? We've got pi minus pi over three, which is just two pi over three. Okay. So you can think about this uh, in the same old way that we did before. Tangent inverse of negative pi over 3. Sorry, negative root 3. It's so many pi over 3's floating around. Tangent inverse of root 3. Well, what angle does that? So when we think about tangent, we think about ratios of x and y. So we think about all the common ones we know that involve root 3. And the, the first one that comes to mind for me is root 3 over 2 divided by 1 half. I know for sure that this thing simplifies down to root 3. One of these has to be negative then. Which one's going to be negative? Well, we look about the we look at the range of tangent inverse. It's only between negative pi over two and pi over two. Every angle here has a positive x value. That means the y must be negative. The y is the sine value. So what angle has a sine value of? <laughs> it's negative pi over three. Okay, we just saw that in part a. Okay. So if we come down here to negative pi over 3, it 
we see that the x coordinate is going to be 1 half and the y coordinate negative root 3 over 2. The ratio of those two gives you root negative root 3. So the tangent inverse of that angle is the angle. Or sorry, of that of that value, the ratio is the angle negative pi over 3. So similar answers for all three parts. Just review though from stuff we've done before. Um, right. So if you have any questions on stuff like this, uh, you need to shoot me an email, you know, or you need to ask up uh, in office hours, or you need to speak up in um, in class because this stuff, this really should just be, you know real basic stuff here. Okay, stuff you should be able to just either snap your fingers and just know or as I've drawn out each time here, draw out the circle, reason through what the angle needs to be or reason what the reference angle needs to be and then and then proceed on, okay? All right. So what other types of questions are there in this section? So here's the first one that they give you. So they have this wonderful drawing of a uh, of a ladder against a building. And they've got all these little windows in here. I'm not going to take too much time to draw this cuz it's just it's not worth the time, but it's just, it's a big building. So I'll put one door here. And there's no windows until you get to the top floor, which is why there's another, which is why there's a ladder here, <laughs> clearly. So they're going to ask a question about this angle here. Now they know that this ladder is 40 feet, and they know that the base of the ladder is exactly six feet from the edge of the building. Okay, this is a this is a rather steep ladder incline, okay? So climbing up this ladder to get to your apartment in the top floor of this building, which is approximately, uh, you know, four stories up. Um, it's a pretty steep climb. The goal is to find this angle up here based on just what we, what we know here, okay? So what do we know about uh, right triangles and what do we know about trig functions? And how are we going to relate that to finding an angle? So here we go. What I see right here is this, this nice right triangle. Right? I would hope it's right. Otherwise, this, this, this building is leaning. If it's not right, then, well, we can use something that we're going to learn about in another section here. Um, but for now, let's suppose it's a right triangle which means we know, in terms of this angle, we know the hypotenuse. I'm just going to list that out. It's 40 feet. We know the opposite side of that angle is 6 feet. And do we have a triangle, sorry, do we have a trig function that relates these two sides? Yes, we, we know that the sine of this angle, theta, is equal to the ratio of the opposite, and I'm going to just remove the, the units now, they're going to cancel. It's the opposite side divided by the hypotenuse. So 6 over 40. Okay. So we know this is a fact. Okay. This is just how you would compute sine of that angle. So at this point, we have a ratio. So how are we going to find the angle? We're just going to take the inverse function. So this is true. Sine of this angle is 6 over 40, if and only if. We have this. Sine inverse of 6 over 40 is our angle. Okay, And that's going to be some angle between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2. What it is, I don't know. <laughs> um, I, I really have no idea. But that's what it is. I could grab a calculator, you know, that has batteries in it, not this one, and I could compute it. You could too, if you cared to know. Okay, that, that would be it. If you want to leave it in exact form, 
that's your answer. Okay, if you want, if you need to estimate that, plug it into a calculator. Um, this one I think is pretty close to like 8 degrees. Okay, it's pretty close to 8. Um, okay, let's, let's do another one of these. Okay, in the next example they give us, um, they say a lighthouse is located on a river. So here's the lighthouse. Is lighthouse one word or two? It looks like one word uh, in the book. So the lighthouse is on this river. And there's a coastline over here. Okay. And looks like an observer walks down the shoreline. And measures this distance here is measured to be angle D. Sorry, by side length D. This is the angle that they're concerned with. So they are exactly exactly across from the lighthouse. Um, and they know, maybe from reading some pamphlet about the, the lighthouse, they know that this lighthouse is two miles offshore. Okay, two miles. And then they walk some distance D down the coast from exactly across from the lighthouse they walk some distance D down the coast. Okay? And then they measure this this angle now to the lighthouse from their straight path up, although I didn't you know, it's kind of curved here. They walk straight down the coast. And then they measure their angle now to the lighthouse. The question is, can you tell me how far they walked? Uh, based on what you know, or can you tell me um, what the angle is based on how far they walked, right? And the answer is yes. We can we can use the trig functions here to determine certain things like this. For example, um, what do we know tangent of that angle to be? Well, tangent is always equal to the opposite side over the adjacent side. So we know this. This is a fact. Okay. Um, so what's the angle? If I if I knew the angle, this would help me compute the distance. So what if I knew the distance and wanted to find the angle? Well, I can still write a formula for that. This is a formula that can be solved to tell me the distance is 2 over tangent theta. This is a formula to tell me the distance given an angle. Okay, what if what about the other way? Can I find a formula to tell me the angle given a distance? So this tangent equation right there at the top is true if and only if we take the inverse of that ratio and we get the angle. Okay, so we've got two little things here um, that tell you some of the necessary geometric information here. Um, if you're just measuring an angle in this problem, you can determine the distance that you've walked. That's pretty nice, just being able to, to just take out your protractor and measure an angle and then use a calculator to say, oh, I've walked three miles, or oh, I've walked seven miles. That's pretty nice, isn't it? Um, it doesn't require that you extend a tape measure here and then pick it up and then place it again and then pick it up and place it again and it doesn't require that you walk with one of those little wheels that measures how far you've walked although it does require you to wear a pocket protector and use a calculator in public so maybe that's maybe that's worse I don't know um, this one here says well hey if you know that distance you can easily find the angle okay so these are these are some good 
good examples of the types of questions that are given in this section. Um, and there's really, there's really not much to it um, from here. So let's find, let's do one hard question now, like, like really hard. These ones are still moderately difficult, I suppose. Um, so the hard ones are these kinds. So this one is example seven in your book. And this one has to do with composition of trig functions. Right, so why is this one hard? So sine inverse of three fifths is going to be plugged into the cosine. So first we got to find that angle, right? So one solution would be to to find that angle and then just plug it into cosine. Uh, and that's not one that you just know, is it? <laughs> that's not one that you've memorized. Can we find it? I don't know. Without a calculator, I don't know. That'd be pretty difficult to estimate um, and difficult to find exactly. Are there other things you can try? Yeah, yes. Yes, you can. And that's what we're going to see here. So we have two situations here. Um, we've got a possibility uh, that when we make some triangle, because that's, that's the section here, right? That when we make some triangle, both the x and the y are negative, or the x is negative and the y is positive. Uh, what am I talking about? We're not talking about tangent. We're talking about sine. OK, it's easier than I. Ah, here we go. So let's make this triangle. We're, we're going to create a triangle based on this ratio. Remember, I just erased the things. The definition of sine is, is uh, uh, the opposite side over the hypotenuse. So what, what's the sine inverse? What's the angle which gives us that ratio? Right, the angle that gives us this, the ratio of three over five. So let me just place this rectangle in sort of standard position with one, one leg being the x-axis. And we'll suppose that this is our angle theta. Okay, that's the standard position angle. And if the sine inverse is being uh, input three-fifths, that means that the ratio of the sine of this angle is three-fifths, which means the opposite side is three and the hypotenuse is five. Don't need to worry about positives and negatives like I was worried about there at the beginning. Okay, so this here is our, is our you know, nearly, uh, nearly complete, nearly solved triangle. So the sine inverse of 3 over 5 is this angle. We don't know what it is, but that's that's what it is. So what's the cosine of that angle? Well, we just look at the triangle. We say it's it's this adjacent side divided by the hypotenuse. So it's x over 5. Can we find x? Yes, we can. Pythagorean theorem would tell us that x is 4. All right, we just take 3 squared from 5 squared. And that gives us x squared. Right? 5 squared equals 3 squared plus x squared. Subtracting 3 squared from both sides gives us that. So this is 16. Right? 25 minus 9 is 16. Subtracting x, uh, excuse me, square rooting x squared now gives us that x is either plus or minus 4. Okay, so we could also have this triangle over here minus 4. Or we could have this triangle over here, minus 4. Why aren't they? Why isn't it this triangle or that triangle? Well, the sine is, is positive 3 over positive 5. The radius always being 5 means that we have either positive 3 here, or we have, um, we have negative 3 here. Uh, so it's definitely not this one. Okay, and then could it be this one? Hmm. That is a good question. Are we given more information? Oh, no, 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 no. It can't be that one. 
Yeah, it can't be that one, and here's why. Uh, what's the range of sine inverse? So we're given no more information, but what's the range of sine inverse? So sine inverse is restricted to angles between pi over 2 and negative pi over 2. And what's this angle to bring us there? Well, it's bigger than a right angle, so it can't be that triangle. So there we have it. So this angle needs to be in quadrant 1 because of the positive y. Okay, So that means we definitely have this angle here in quadrant 1, which means this is positive 4, not the negative. Okay, So yeah, just a little bit more difficult of a problem. Um, the common theme here in this problem and in the previous two is that we're just working with triangles. So you're going to use your knowledge of the definitions of sines and cosines, such as uh, opposite over hypotenuse, adjacent over hypotenuse, and tangent opposite over adjacent to construct some triangle. From that triangle you're going to try and solve for additional information that you need, uh, such as in this case we didn't have a third side. And then what you're going to do is sort of re-piece re it all back together to find the thing that you, you're looking for. Um, another key theme here is that feel free to use, uh, you can feel free to use inverse functions to uh, sort of abstractly here uh, to find some angle even though you don't know what it is uh, you can find you can use inverse functions to, to find these angles inside triangles and then and use that to your advantage too or in the first examples of the day to literally calculate angles just make sure you're matching up the range of your inverse functions uh, correctly okay uh, and that's the thing that I forgot about here so that's a good example of knowing which triangle you're talking about based on the range of your inverse function. And that's it. That's it for section 6.4. So I'll have another video here in a minute uh, talking about material from section 6.5 and the law of signs. Um, so I will see you for that one, and I hope this helps. Until then.